Ambassador Thomas Kafka, Ambassador Boaz Modai, Deputy Ambassador Nurit, Lady Na, I don't you know how to pronounce it right when I spoke to you, is it Milena? Milena. Oh, yeah. Lady Milena, our guest of honor this evening, friends, ladies and gentlemen. The Jewish Historical Society, in cooperation with the Irish Jewish Museum, the Czech Embassy, and Dublin City Libraries, is delighted to welcome you to this symposium dedicated to Sir Nicholas Winton, who celebrated his 104th birthday last weekend. We're going to hear a little bit more about that, I'm sure, later. Some of you will have watched one or both of the movies that were screened uh, yesterday and today at the Rathmines Library. Um, those of you that did will agree that both of them, the fictionalized mm -hmm. version of the story and the, um, and the documentary, just very, very moving. When Nicholas Winton got it into his lovely head to rescue Milena and all the other Winton children from Prague, he did it against the background of a refugee crisis that hit a country known as Czechoslovakia. And the ambassador gave us uh, some uh, background to this. So I just want to take a quick peek at what was this Czechoslovakian state that was created for the very first time. During the First World War, Czech and Slovak leaders, uh, Tomasz um, Masaryk in the USA, um, Benes in France and Britain, and Stefanik in France, formed what was called the Czechoslovak National Council. And that council wanted to get the Allies backing to create a future Czechoslovakian uh, state and government. And they got their wish, and Czechoslovakian independence was officially proclaimed in Prague on October the 28th, 1918, even before the First World War was over. And Masaryk was declared president on November the 14th, three days after the end of the First World War. And what's interesting is this new democratic Czechoslovak state had a population of only 13 and a half million and yet was one of the world's top 10 industrialized countries. And anyone who knows anything about uh, the uh, industrial history of, um, of Czechoslovakia would know that it was always regarded as a very, um, uh, a very successful in, in that area. But most of the light and heavy industries were located in the, in the Sudetenland region. And those of you that understand what that means will see the significance. So the focus of my talk this evening is the relations between Britain and Czechoslovakia. Obviously, Czechoslovakia is where the children came from. Britain is where Winton came from. And Britain is where the children arrived. And our first stop in examining this relationship is Ethiopia. During the 30s, obviously, during the 30s, the Italians under Mussolini felt that they had every much a right to an empire as Britain and France. And ignoring sanctions from the League of Nations, Mussolini attacked Abyssinia, modern-day Ethiopia, adding to its possessions in neighboring Eritrea and Somalia. November 1935, Britain avoided a confrontation with Italy by joining France in conducting secret discussions with Mussolini. Eamon de Valera announced in a radio broadcast to the Irish people that Ireland was prepared to back military action against Italy. Not many people know that. And later, addressing the League of Nations, de Valera said, over 50 nations we banded ourselves together for collective security. Over 50 nations we have now to confess publicly that we must abandon the victim to his fate. It is a sad confession, as well as a bitter one. It is the fulfillment of the worst predictions of all those who decried the League and said it could not succeed. Very interesting that in 1935, de Valero was prepared to go to war, and Britain and France weren't. As Italian troops were massing 
to invade Ethiopia, Anthony Eden, Britain's representative at the League of Nations, future Prime Minister, called Eamon de Valera a firebrand for his threat to back military action against Italy. So Britain had avoided confrontation with Italy through a policy of appeasement. A pattern had now been established. Next, we move to the Rhineland. Under the Treaty of Locarno in 1925, Germany had accepted the demilitarization of the Rhineland. Gambling that Britain and France would not interfere, Hitler sent German forces to occupy the Rhineland in March 1936. Now, Hitler ordered his officers, he said, if there's any resistance from the French army, you withdraw. France took no action beyond lodging protests with the ineffectual League of Nations. Hitler's gamble had paid off, and once again, Britain had avoided confrontation by appeasing the aggressor. Our next stop is Austria. Although the Treaty of Versailles explicitly forbade a union between Austria and Germany, Hitler had long determined to unify the two countries. February 1938, he summoned the Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg, and under threat of war, he demanded that Austrian Nazis be allowed to participate in the government. Schuschnigg complied, but to preserve Austria's independence, he scheduled a plebiscite on the unification issue for the 13th of March. Hitler demanded that the plebiscite be cancelled, and on the 11th of March, he sent an ultimatum to Schuschnigg, hand over all power to the Austrian Nazis or face an invasion. When Schuschnigg realized that neither France nor Britain would actively support him in resisting this blatant aggression and contravention of the Treaty of Versailles, he resigned. The next day saw the Anschluss when the Wehrmacht crossed the Austrian border. In the House of Commons, British Prime Minister Chamberlain said, the hard fact is that nothing could have arrested what has actually happened unless this country and other countries had been prepared to use force. For the third time in four years, Britain had failed to confront the aggressor. It was only a matter of time before a fourth test of nerve occurred, and this time that test took place in Czechoslovakia. Beneath the surface of a functioning democracy in Czechoslovakia, ethnic tensions existed particularly among the German-speaking minority. Konrad Heinlein's pro-Nazi Sudeten German party had become the country's second largest political party. Shortly after the Anschluss, Hitler ordered Heinlein to raise demands that were clearly unacceptable to the Czechoslovak government. This threat to a functioning democracy should have generated a robust response from Britain and France, especially because France had a treaty with Czechoslovakia. But as we saw, the two Western powers had already shown their true colors in Abyssinia, in the Rhineland, and in Austria. They had shown that appeasement was the order of the day. It didn't help matters that Chamberlain actually justified Sudeten German grievances. He saw Hitler as a responsible statesman whose word was to be trusted. So what does Britain do? Chamberlain called for the Czechoslovaks to concede to Germany's demands. He pushed President Benes to accept a mediator. Unwilling to sever his government's ties with Britain, where he had spent some of the First World War preparing for Czechoslovak independence, Benes reluctantly agreed. Former cabinet minister Lord Runciman arrived in Prague on the 3rd of August 1938. In the meantime, the German press was demonizing Czechoslovakia with a steady stream of atrocity stories about the treatment of Sudeten Germans at the hands of their Czechoslovakian tormentors. Hitler calculated that Czechoslovakia would refuse to be pressured, 
allowing Britain to feel morally justified in abandoning the Czechoslovaks to their fate. He was wrong about the Czechoslovaks. They allowed themselves to be pressured. But Hitler was right about the British. They abandoned Czechoslovakia to its fate. Hitler sent 750,000 soldiers to the border with Czechoslovakia, and in early September 1938, Benes agreed to grant almost all the German demands. But at a Nazi part, he rallied in Nuremberg. Hitler denounced the Czechoslo Czechoslovakia as being a fraudulent state. Doesn't that ring a bell, ladies and gentlemen? I know of a modern-day state in the Eastern Mediterranean which is also being called a fraudulent state by useful idiots. There now followed a round of meetings. Chamberlain asked for a personal meeting with Hitler and the two leaders met in Germany on the 15th of September. And the dates here are very, very critical. Hitler told Chamberlain that his minimum demand was self-determination for the Sudeten Germans. Chamberlain flew home the same day, and French Prime Minister Deladier flew to London the following day for talks. Britain and France put pressure on Czechoslovakia to cede to Germany all the territories where the German population, or the German-speaking population, represented over 50% of the Sudetenland's total population. In exchange, Britain and France would guarantee the independence of the truncated Czechoslovakian state. At first, Czechoslovakia refused, but after Mussolini agree, as announced that he supported the German demands, Czechoslovakia agreed on the 16th of September to the demands of Britain, France, and Germany. But it was too late. The next day, Hitler upped the ante, insisting that the claims of ethnic Germans in Poland and Hungary also be satisfied. September the 22nd, Chamberlain flies for a second time to Germany, announcing that my objective is peace in Europe. I trust this trip is the way to that peace. Hitler promised Chamberlain that if Britain and France agreed to the annexation of the Sudetenland, Germany would have no further territorial claims upon Czechoslovakia. And tragically, Chamberlain believed him. September the 23rd, Czechoslovakia announced a general mobilization, indicating that it was prepared to protect the country along its excellent line of border fortifications. The next day, Chamberlain returned home. He announced that Hitler demanded the immediate annexation of the Sudetenland, and this caused an unexpected surge of support for Czechoslovakia in Britain. He wasn't expecting that. Winston Churchill warned, the partition of Czechoslovakia under pressure from England and France amounts to the complete surrender of the Western democracies to the Nazi threat of force. Such a collapse will bring peace or security neither to England nor to France. September the 26th, Chamberlain informed Hitler that the Allies wanted a peaceful resolution to the Sudeten crisis. The same evening, Hitler issued an ultimatum. Czechoslovakia had less than 48 hours until the 28th of September at 2 o'clock in the afternoon to cede the Sudetenland to Germany or face war. The day before the ultimatum was due to expire, Chamberlain made his now famous remark on the radio. How horrible, fantastic, incredible it is that we should be digging trenches and trying on gas masks here because, because of a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. I find it incredible that after watching Hitler's policies unfold for years, Chamberlain was blind enough to describe Hitler's bullying of Czechoslovakia as a quarrel between people of whom we know nothing. 
on the 28th of September, hours before the deadline, Mussolini, at Britain's urging, asked Hitler for a 24-hour delay. And it was agreed to convene a four-power conference the next day, 29th of September, involving Britain, France, Germany, and Italy. Oh, and conspicuous by their absence were the Czechoslovaks who weren't invited. Chamberlain flew to Germany for the third time in two weeks and at 1.30 a.m. We're used to that here when the unions and the government talked in the middle of the night, but this was quite unusual. 1.30 a.m., September the 30th, Hitler, Chamberlain, de Lavier and Mussolini signed the Munich Agreement by which the German army would complete the occupation of the Sudetenland by October the 10th and an international commission would decide the future of other disputed areas. So just two weeks after offering the guarantee to the independence of Czechoslovakia, Britain and France now offered Czechoslovakia a stark choice submit to the annexations or face the Nazi Germany threat alone. The Czechoslovak government had little choice but to agree. Before returning to Britain, Chamberlain had obtained Hitler's agreement to sign a peace treaty between Britain and Germany. And when Chamberlain landed at Heston Aerodrome that same evening, he addressed the waiting crowd waving a famous piece of paper. We've all seen the photos. And this is what he said. The settlement of the Czechoslovakian problem which has now been achieved is, in my view, only the prelude to a larger settlement in which all Europe may find peace. This morning I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler, and here is the paper which bears his name upon it, as well as mine. Later that day, he stood outside number 10 Downing Street and again read from the document and he concluded, My good friends, for the second time in our history, a British Prime Minister has returned from Germany bringing peace with honour. Uh, the first time he'd been in Israeli, about 70 years earlier, when he came back from the Congress of Berlin. I believe it is peace for our time. That terrible phrase, peace for our time. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Go home and get a nice, quiet sleep. Following day, the Nazis moved into the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia lost its defensible border with Germany. A few days later, Benes was, was forced to resign under German pressure and Emil Hascher was chosen as president and a bitterly disappointed Benes went into exile to Britain. In addition to losing three and a half million of its citizens, Czechoslovakia lost 70% of its iron and steel and 70% of its electrical power. Immediately after the occupation of the Sudetenland, and we heard this also from Milena, thousands of terrified refugees, Jews, communists, and other anti-Nazis swarmed into Prague. And these were the refugees that Winton witnessed when he came to Prague. That's the moment in time that Winton arrived when this wave of refugees was reaching Prague from the Sudetenland. Chamberlain had said that the settlement of the Czechoslovakian problem was only the prelude to a larger settlement in which all Europe may find peace. And of course, the opposite was true. The settlement of the Czechoslovakian problem was only the prelude to a larger con conflagration that we know as the Second World War with its parallel catastrophe, the Holocaust. And as was predictable, Hitler did not keep his promise about the rest of Czechoslovakia. On the 14th of March 1939, Slovakia seceded from Czechoslovakia and became a separate pro-Nazi state. Slovakia, we heard earlier from Mona, that's where our good friend Tommy Reichenthal is right now, um, talking to people there 
because he, his, his family was shocked by locals in Slovakia, and that's how they found themselves in Bergen-Belsen. Czechoslovak President Hasha traveled to Berlin and was forced to sign his acceptance of the German occupation of the remainder of Bohemia and Moravia. And as Churchill has predicted, German armies now entered Prague and proceeded to occupy the rest of the country. And it was during this small window of opportunity between the Munich Agreement and the German occupation of Czechoslovakia that Nicholas Winton, in just three weeks as we heard, embarked on his mission to save Jewish children. When he first toured the refugee camps that were filled with Jews who had fled from the Sudetenland, he was struck mainly by the fact that no one seemed to be prioritizing the children. Winton's genius lay in sorting through the chaos and horror to see what had to be done to get the children out. <coughs> Milliner mentioned that he asked for a postponement of a week from his boss in London. His boss responded, I don't know why you want to waste your time in Czechoslovakia doing what you say is good work when there's money to be made on the stock exchange. Yeah. Creating his now famously unauthorized children's section of the British Committee for Refugees from Czechoslovakia, and those of us that were lucky enough to be in this um, same hall uh, a couple of weeks ago, we heard about another unauthorized committee that was created at the same time by Rabbi Solomon Schoenfeld, who created the Chief Rabbi's Emergency Religious Council when there wasn't any such thing and he created himself as the executive um, director of a non-existent organization, which allowed him to prance around the home office and, and make all sorts of deals for the thousands of people he managed to get in. So there's a really interesting parallel here. Two mavericks who forged documents, forged their own organizations, and thank God got away with it. He set up his operations in Prague, sometimes working out of the lobby of the uh, hotel in Wenceslas Square. Word spread quickly that Winton was, and he was besieged daily with pleas for help. His fluency in German, he spoke German, <coughs> helped him expedite matters as he compiled lists of children in need and danger. He soon had a list and photographs of 760 children, and it was this list that he took back with him to Britain on the 21st of January, 1939. Three weeks is all he spent. Uh, some of the movies, the fictionalized ones, show him there to the end, but he wasn't. He had three weeks in Prague, that, which makes the Winton miracle, I think, even more incredible. <laughs> And every evening after the stock exchange closed in London, Winton used his fabricated children's section stationery to complete the various requirements necessary for the children to be admitted to Britain. He lobbied the Home Office for permits, he found guarantors, he sent photos of children to people willing to act as their guardians and dossiers to those willing to accommodate them, he raised money, he generated publicity, and he put ads in the paper with children's pictures. He put angelic-looking children in the paper as a way of getting people to say, oh, I'd, I'd like, I, I, I'll adopt uh, that child. And of course, the deteriorating situation in Prague added to the urgency. He planned the evacuation of the Jewish children from Prague, but he needed help. And we heard earlier there was a lady called Doreen Warriner who arrived in Prague in October 38. She established and headed up the office that Winton and other rescuers worked with. And there was also a gentleman called Ch Trevor Chadwick, played a very important role handling the logistics in Prague for the Winton transports. As we heard in the ambassador's opening remarks, the first success of Winton's kinder, trans Winton's kinder transports was on March the 14th. 1939, the first kinder transport from Prague was in a plane, a plane load of children, and Gerda Meyer, who we heard about earlier, was one of the children on that plane. There weren't that many kids on the plane, so the first transport was a plane. 
The date is important because it was the last day of Czechoslovakian independence. Thanks to Chadwick's ability to form a working relationship with the German occupiers of Prague, seven trainloads, as we heard, of Winton children left Prague. Chadwick and Warriner saw the children off on the platform, and we saw in Prague's Wilson station, we saw pictures of the station, and in Liverpool Street station, in London, Winton and his mother Barbara met every single transport, and they didn't leave the station until every single child with a famous ticket around their neck had been allocated and found a home. That one plane and the seven trains saved 669 children. And as we heard, the eighth train with 250 children, the children were on the train in Wilson Station ready to go. The war broke out. It stayed in the station three days and the children had to leave the train. And to the best of our knowledge, none of them survived. Now, incidentally, although we call these transports kinder transports, they're not to be confused with the main kinder transport program, which brought 10,000 children, including my father, my aunt, and the late Geoffrey Phillips, to safety in Britain following the intervention of Britain's Central Council for Jewish Refugees. This is called the Winton kinder transports. My friends, we saw this evening how Britain's unwillingness to stand up to Hitler or Mussolini in Abyssinia, the Rhineland and Austria meant that Britain was never going to stand up for Czechoslovakia. All Britain gained by not supporting Czechoslovakia was that Hitler had another year to prepare for war. Chamberlain had complained about a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. Perhaps if he bothered to understand why that faraway country was so important, the Second World War and the Holocaust could have been shorter. Perhaps if people had listened to Churchill, things would have been different. One week before Munich, he warned, the partition of Czechoslovakia under pressure from England and France will bring neither security nor peace. And he was right. The ambassador quoted earlier from Bertolt Brecht. I will quote from the ambassador's namesake, Franz Kafka. And anyone who tries to claim that there's no connection between the two, forget about it. Kafka said, from a certain point onward, there is no longer any turning back. Wasn't this so true of Nicholas Winton? He knew he had to save the children, and he didn't stop until he was forced to stop. There's a saying from the ethics of the fathers, Pekei Avot, Bamakom she'en anashim, hishtadel liyot ish. In a place where there are no men, strive to be a man. Winton saw that there were no men in Prague. So he stepped up to the mark. He strove to be a man. And for 669 children, including Gerda Meyer and our honored guest here this evening, Lady Milena, Nicholas Winton was the man. We salute his bravery, his chutzpah, his humility, and his humanity. As Ambassador Kafka says, he was and is a true hero. Allow me to finish with a very short poem written by Gerda Meyer for young children, a poem that expresses her longing for her Czechoslovak roots. All the leaves have lost their trees. Child, what tumbled words are these? Yet I grieve for my lost tree. Far away the wind bore me. Thank you very much.